Hi everyone, Asaki from Pastry here, and welcome to the first episode of the Playtime! Yay! <laughs> so today I will be introducing our first play. This one. Dadam. Hold these truths. A solo play by Jean Sakata, inspired by the life. Yep. Inspired by the life of Gordon Hirabayashi. I just thought there is a true life, but there is no true. But it is based on a true story. <laughs> so what is this play about? This is about a man, a Japanese American man who went and fight for his constitutional rights as an American citizen during World War II. Yeah, so uh, let's begin. Have you ever had a moment in your life that you realize that you are or your family is different from others in different in any way, you know, racially or the family structure or anything? Where were you? How old were you? Who was with you? So there is a moment like Gordon is taking a bath outside of the house on this, I think it's like a wooden barrel or something with his friend. And he was looking at his friend's face that kind of looks similar to his, like, you know, his skin tone, the hair and the eyes are black. And he kind of realizes like, oh, we are different from our neighbors. So that's like at the beginning of the play that him realizing as age four or five, that him and his family are different. So um, I just wanted to explain something before I go deep into the story. He is a Nisei, Japanese American. Nisei means um, second generation in Japanese. Uh, and for first generation, it's called Issei, which is for this story uh, is his parents. It's a little confusing because in English, um, immigrants are immigrants and their children is going to be the first generation. So I'm an immigrant and if I ever have kids, they're going to be the first uh, generation of whatever it is. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that because it could get a little confusing before I start. So the time passes, Gordon goes to college, you know, he goes to University of Washington in Seattle. He faced some of the discrimination that, you know, there's a certain neighborhoods or stores he cannot go because either he get teased or attacked or, you know, in the stores that they're, they say, I'm sorry for the derogatory, but no jabs. So he's not going to get served or he probably going to get kicked out. But he goes to college and he has friends. He has, there's like a little love interest story going on. And he was like um, president of the y campus YMCA. And there's a scene that he tried to get a job at the branch of YMCA downtown as a front desk person. So he goes to this interview and this person who was interviewing him says, I'm sorry, I cannot hire you. And he's like, why? I'm the president of campus Y. Like, I have all those credentials. Why are you not hiring me? And the guy says, well, you know, our patrons, the people who donate, like, a lot of money for them. I don't want to offend them for someone like you being at the front desk. And he says, so you were saying somebody like me would be offensive in an organization that promotes the brotherly love to all those foreign countries, sending missionaries to all those foreign countries. And the guy who, is, who was um, interviewing him gets so embarrassed, but he didn't get a job. So that was like his daily life. But, you know, he was just being a college student. He has this group of friends. He studies at night in the library. And then one day on December 7th of 1941, if you know the history, what happens? Yes, Pearl Harbor. 
and Japanese people become the enemy of the state, like overnight. So that changes his life, you know, upside down. At the beginning, the country only places a curfew order. So all the Japanese people and Japanese descendants needs to be at their home by nine o'clock at night. And that applies to Gordon who was living in a dorm on campus. So they're studying, studying, studying. And somebody said, Gordon, it's almost nine. And he has to scramble and go back to his dorm room. So he's not gonna get in trouble. From what I gather from this play, there's a lot of confusion about what is defined as Japanese descendants because there has been immigration going on since late uh, 19th century in America. So there has been generations of Japanese people who have been living in the United States in 1940s. And some of them are mixed race. So people are asking to the government, like who is considered as Japanese, which means like who we, who do we need to send to this incarceration camp? And at the end, I believe you, if you are 116th Japanese, you're considered as Japanese. So think about it. 116th is like what? Great grandparents. If your great grandparents are Japanese, you're considered as Japanese. Like I cannot put into words how ridiculous it is. I mean, this whole circumstance is ridiculous to start with. And you have to go all the way back there. Like, come on. (sighs) Gordon's parents came from Japan. So Gordon is only the second generation Nisei. So they haven't been around for that long but they had their lives, they had the houses, they had the businesses or works, and Gordon was in college, everything needed to be abandoned in very short notice. And they only allowed to take two suitcases, two, two suitcase each person. And they don't tell you like where they're going. Like they just put you on a train and ships you to wherever, and that takes days to get there. So there is this, oh God, there's this scene. He talks about Japanese people trying to get rid of or sell their car or their stores with full stock of produce for literally pennies and dimes or you know, putting their possession on the car because they just cannot sell it. And all those people from the neighborhood come to just, you know, take it, taking advantage of it. And Gordon says, no, this is not right. I am American. I was born and raised here. I am loyal to this country. So what you're doing is not right. So he was taken to a police station. He was arrested and... He eventually get um, prosecuted and charged for, I believe like at the beginning, it was like three, uh, 30 days for something and 30 days for something. So like altogether it was like, let me double check that. So, okay, I just checked. Uh, so there are two counts. One was for a violation of the curfew and the other one was for the exclusion order. And each sentence was 30 days. And he said, oh, could you actually up the count? Because it has to be more than 90 days in order to serve the sentence outside of a building. And I've been cooped up in this building at the jail for, I think it was like five months and I just don't want to do that anymore. And (laughs) Um, one great thing about Gordon Hirabayashi and this play is there is a lot of humor to it. Uh, this exchange between him and the judge about this is almost like I was cracking up. Judge is like, wait, are you asking me to increase your sentence? And Gordon's like, yeah, I want to be outside. I don't want to cooped up. And judge is like, wow, I never got that before but okay I'm gonna up each count to 90 days so you're gonna be sentenced for 180 days 
But the problem is we don't have money to ship you all the way down to Tucson, Arizona. They're still in Washington state. And Gordon's like, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, take a, a Greyhound bus down there with all my own money. And just is like, well, if you can do that, that'd be great. So <laughs> he just get out. But then he's just like, well, why do I have to spend money? So he, he takes down to Tucson, Arizona, <laughs> which is like, what? <laughs> like you are going so much, you're going through so much trouble to serve your sentence, which is like hilarious in a way. I, I love that part so much. So one of the highlights of this play is the court drama, which I love. And this happens toward the end of the play. Uh, in this case, Hirabayashi versus United States goes to Supreme Court. And all the Supreme Court judges, you know, have conflict about his argument that, yes, what we are doing, is it constitutional? Are we violating what this country was established or built upon? You know, all men are free, which we know it's not true, but I'm just set that aside. All those Americans are being incarcerated without a trial or even like a fair legal representation. Another theme of this play that is very close to home is that family dynamic. So Gordon is Chona, which is which means eldest son of the family. And as a traditional Japanese family, he's considered has greater responsibility to the family than the rest of the siblings. He has quite a few brothers and a sister, I believe. So his mother says to him, like, you are Jonan, you're the eldest son. You know, you have to obey your parents and you have a responsibility to your family. When Gordon said, like, I'm not going to obey to this exclusion order. Most of the Japanese people who are living in the States at the time obey this exclusion order fairly quietly. I know Gordon was not the only person who fought against this exclusion order. There, um, Mr. Fred Korematsu wasn't one of the, is one of them. I know there is like another man. I This number escapes my, my mind right now. And Gordon says... No, I'm an American. This is not right. And also being raised as an American, I think his idea as an, as an individual sometimes has bigger priority than his responsibility as, um, as a chonan, as the eldest son to the family. So that balance, that conflict between the family and the individual was, ah. Uh, I think everybody goes through that. <laughs> Another thread that goes uh, throughout the play is this Japanese old proverb. It said, um, means a nail sticking out gets hit. Like I heard that million times growing up, right? Like Japanese society really focuses on the harmony among a group, right? Whether this is a family or a, a class or a work or even the society, the harmony between this group is most important. So if you are sticking out like a nail and disturb this harmony, you are seeing as a trouble. And Gordon is a trouble. <laughs> So all those like uh, friends of the family start calling, you know, his parents like, what are you doing? What is Gordon doing? He shouldn't go against the government. He shouldn't do that. Like he's putting us into the danger because at the time, even though the government was incarcerating all the Japanese people, I don't think they told them where they are taking them to, Right. So they could be just taken to in the middle of nowhere and got shot and, and left to be eaten by, you know, bears and wolves and stuff. So um, yeah, that is another 
you know, family dynamic that Gordon had to deal with. One scene that really brought me to tears is the scene where Gordon's far father was burning the old photos from back in Japan. So he's not going to be seen as disloyal to the country. Like everything that is related to the old tradition of Japan, whether it's a language or a photo or anything, need to be erased and they have to be assimilated to this majority, which at the time is white culture. So this is a really interesting dynamic between the, the desire of Japanese people to be harmonious and um, majority white American people want those foreigners to be assimilated to their culture and custom. This should, this usually makes a pretty harmonious marriage. But again, the snail sticking out says, no, I'm an American and what you're doing is not right. So as you can see, a lot of these themes are still relevant for us in 2020. This play was premiered in 2004. And so some of the sentiments might be contemporary, but um, the playwright Jean, Jean, I think it's Jean. If I'm wrong, I'm so sorry. Miss Sakata <laughs> interviewed um, Gordon Hirabayashi for hours before she wrote this play. So even though she said some of the chronological orders of the events that she changed for the dramatic effect, everything that happened was based on a true story. And this is really important. I thought this was really important as a, as a part of preservation of the history. Like I didn't know anything about incarceration of Japanese Americans until maybe 10 years ago. Like we didn't learn anything about that in Japan, right? In a history class. And I love history and I, I watch a lot of history, like TV shows and read a lot of books, but I never heard about it until pretty recently. So it's important to know the history so we will not going to repeat the same mistake in the future. I'm not gonna tell you what happens in the end. You need to read that. And there's a link to the publisher uh, where you can buy this play and read it by yourself. It's a really quick read. I'm a slow reader, and but it took me only a couple hours to finish and I really enjoyed it. So I really recommend it. Did I say really like six times in one sentence? Anywho, but one thing to know, well, as you can see, Gordon Hirabayashi survived and he got a PhD in sociology and taught in many university and ends up in teaching in Canada until he retires and he passed away in 2012. So he lived over 90 years. Uh, I found the footage of his, one of his interviews, not by Sakara, but by a nonprofit organization called Densho, which means oral history in Japanese. So Densho is organization who is trying to archive the oral history of the incarceration of Japanese Americans by this exclusion order. Interview with Dr. Hirabayashi is one of them. So if you're interested, I also gonna put that link to the uh, YouTube video and the Densho website on this post. So please check it out. It's really neat to get to hear him actually talking about what he experienced. As a closing, I wanna read a passage from this play. Uh, to just give you a little bit of flavor of what kind of writing it is, what kind of style, what kind of voice uh, this play has. So this is when curfew was placed and Gordon is still in college. And somebody says, hey, Gordon, you have to go back to your dorm so you're not gonna get in trouble, right? So here we go. Oh, Gordy, five to eight. 
five to eight, shoot. Gordon repeats the lap. Oh my God, I just realized the curfew was eight, not nine, sorry. <laughs> One more time. Oh, Gordy, five to eight, five to eight, shoot. Gordon repeats the lap, sound cue, rain falling. I dash out into the pouring rain, down the stairs, the courtyard. If I run, I'll just make it. Past the fountain and the flagpole, with the flag drooping in the fog. The flag. Gordon slows to stop. He takes a long beat, staring up at the flag. And then this question hits me. Why the hell am I running back? So I hope this was entertaining and informative and made you want to read this play. Um, and as I said, there is a link for you to buy it so you can actually read it. So the next one, yay, next one. And we already have a plan next month. So they ask themselves, is that right? because the, the government is reacting the mass hysteria, I will be dropping another episode of Playtime and I'll be introducing <laughs> Water by the Spoonful by Chiara Allegria Hudes. I'm pretty sure you heard about that one because it's super famous. It's everyone's favorite. And for this episode, like I said in the trailer, trailer, uh, we will be doing a live digital play reading event on Facebook. I hope we, I'll see you there. So until then, see you. Happy Halloween. Don't party too hard.